Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully doing well. Well, this is a fun lesson we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this is Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized how complicated this actually uh some of the stuff in this uh, chapter really gets pretty deep. So I'm not sure if I'm going to actually go through all the verses I've actually got, or it may take two days. Uh, so uh, we'll see. We'll just go through it and see where the Lord leads me. So let's start with a prayer. Oh, Lord, please be with us and help us to, to uh, see your word and to see into what you want us to see today. And help me, Lord, to uh, be able to pass it on to the folks uh, in a logical way. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think uh, the fascinating part about this particular part of the story is that... Let me bring this map in here because uh, I think that's probably a great place to start. We're talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, I guess, bring up one quick verse uh, that uh, is the main the beginning here. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judea. Let me get the verse out of the way for a minute. I realize that as far as we know, uh, and based on all accounts, uh, Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. Uh, that's where they met. That's where they were from. Jesus was uh, uh, raised in Nazareth. And that's where Mary and Joseph uh, started out before Jesus was born. So when all this happened, uh, they were up in Nazareth. Well, you can see by this map that uh, Nazareth is in northern uh, Israel. And the typical way that they traveled uh, this time frame, remember, it was really dangerous travel because it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of thieves. And there was actually a lot of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. And you can see Samaria right there in the middle. So the direct route typically wasn't used to avoid any confrontation with the Samaritans in, there in Samaria. So they would uh, travel over to the uh, Jordan River, travel down the Jordan River uh, and cross over there near Jericho and over to Jerusalem. And then uh, in this case, uh, we know that Elizabeth, uh, whose husband uh, was Zacharias, was a uh, temple priest, uh, worked in Jerusalem, and he lived in the hill country of Judea. And we saw in that verse it actually said that. And so you can see where it's at. In linear distance, that's about 100 miles. And so we're not talking about a uh, short little uh, uh, cross town kind of thing. And so uh, it really got me uh, thinking about the fact that uh, Mary talked about going to visit him. So I'm sure that Joseph, even though they weren't married yet, uh, they were betrothed to each other. And Joseph being a, a, you know, a good righteous man would not want her to travel alone. Uh, this is a very dangerous territory. Uh, you could be uh, taken over by thieves, you could be killed. And right at the moment, she is actually pregnant with our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> and so I can see that Joseph would want to make sure she got there safely. So I'm thinking that he actually took her there himself and maybe even brought some of his friends along. But I found this picture, and I guess kind of gave me an idea of, uh, of the, this picture here. You can see she's kind of pregnant. So this is probably later. Uh, it's not right now. Probably more like this one. Uh, but I can see Joseph uh, carrying her down uh, to uh, visit her uh, cousin Elizabeth and making sure she got there safely. And I just got some other pictures here. This picture is actually from 1800. Uh, some believe that uh, Hebron uh, was the area that they lived in. And this is a uh, picture from around 1900 or late 1800s of Hebron, where uh, it's where uh, Abraham was buried. Uh, and so uh, this is a, you can kind of get an idea what that area looked like. Because believe it or not, not a whole lot happened between 100 AD and the 1900s when it came to uh, the type of living uh, arrangements he had in that general area. Uh, remember the Jews were uh, pretty much out of Jerusalem by 70 AD, and it stayed in the lake stayed pretty desolate until about uh, until the early 1900s when uh, uh, England uh, started allowing the Jews to come back into uh, Israel. 
So you can see that our travel back then was still by uh, horse and uh, and walking was a, a mainstay. Uh, this might be a typical uh, outside of a place uh, they lived. I got some better pictures than that. And these are reenactments, some kids that are actually uh, portraying what it was like to live in that time frame and some of the things they did. You know, some kids posing for a picture there with the uh, with their olives uh, there, kind of in the uh, type of uh, clothing they would wear. And this would be a typical looking house. And unlike us, where we have backyards and stuff, typically there, you see how they got that top area up top there. And a lot of stuff was actually done on top of the house. And so they would live underneath. And actually, uh, typically, there'd be like a few levels where underneath the, the, the base floor uh, would actually be where the animals are kept or the mangers and now it's called a manger <clears throat> and you had the living quarters upstairs kind of like what you see here and then they would have a roof where they would go up and uh, kind of relax uh, and it'd be kind of like their living room <clears throat> here's a painting of a typical village uh, this particular uh, time frame first century AD And I think I showed these pictures already of a, a carpenter shop, you know, where Joseph was a carpenter and he raised Jesus to, uh, to understand carpentry. So this is a depiction of what a carpenter shop might have looked like back then. Those are my pictures. So why don't we just leave this as the backdrop? And so, uh, because we know that she's gonna be traveling down here. And the first thing uh, we're talking about Hebron uh, as being the, uh, probably the city and there's a few, uh, uh, it's situated in the hill country of Judea is where Hebron is. There's a few verses that kind of point to that over in uh, Joshua 11.21. At that time came Joshua and cut off the uh, Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debar, from Anib, and from all the mountains of Judea, and from all the mountains of, oh, I need the bigger one. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. What I'm leading to here is that Joshua originally uh, inhabited these places and it talks about Hebron and the hill country. And they gave them the city of Areba, the father of Anak, uh, which city is Hebron in the hill country of Judea with the suburbs thereof round about it. So these are some verses that point to the hill country as a reference to the uh, area around Hebron. And also this is where the, uh, uh, the children of Aaron uh, Thus they gave to the children of Aaron, the priest, Hebron with her suburbs to be a city of refuge for the slayer and Libani with her suburbs. So it kind of tells us that uh, it's a pretty good, uh, oh, uh, pretty good uh, <laughs> evidence that uh, Hebron was the city that most of the priests lived in. Okay, back to Luke 140. And entered in the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Interesting turn there. And that, uh, as soon as I remember that, uh, so like I said, we've got a hundred miles difference between them. Uh, and that uh, there's no way they didn't have text messages, they didn't have phones, they didn't have any of that kind of stuff. Uh, there was mail systems, but uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, you know that Mary just got found out about this, uh, and we were told that the uh, in the, uh, the uh, Gabriel had told Mary that his uh, that her cousin Elizabeth was six months with child. And so uh, she was excited to tell her about the visit she had. So she's racing down there to try to see her. When I say racing, it probably took like a, a week or two uh, to get down there. And so she enters into the house of Zachariah, Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. <clears throat> And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. The more I read this and the more I studied it, I realized that the words that are going to follow from here are actually not theirs, but of the Holy Spirit. And it gives you a lot of insight into how knowledgeable uh, Mary was, actually, of the scriptures uh, that, uh, for a woman, that was unusual, because they weren't usually trained in the Torah uh, or the scriptures of that time frame. And so all I can figure is that uh, most likely all the information she's getting as we want to see going forward here is based on what the Holy Spirit was leading her to say. <clears throat> okay, verse 42. 
And she spoke out loud, out with a loud voice and said, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now that's Elizabeth talking and she's talking to Mary and Mary has not even told her yet uh, of what uh, the messenger told her. Uh, she's got to be less than a month pregnant because uh, the messenger had just told her what was going to happen. And that, uh, as we're going to see here, Elizabeth is six months pregnant. So if Mary's already pregnant, she can't be more than a few weeks at the most. And I think that's an important aspect to realize is that uh, by, the, by these verses we see here, you can definitely see that uh, a baby is a baby at uh, conception. And that, uh, <clears throat> I think that's an important attribute that as we'll, we read these verses, you're going to see that uh, Elizabeth knew because the Holy Spirit filled her because she sensed the, the Lord was there amongst them uh, when Mary arrived at her house. Verse 43. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This is actually considered a song, by the way. Uh, I never knew that before now. But this area here, this particular song here is sung by Elizabeth. And it was considered the first song of the New Testament. Kind of interesting. But also that uh, you see where it says there, uh, the mother of my Lord should come to me. Now, how did Elizabeth know that uh, Mary was pregnant with the Lord? Uh, I think the only way that she could know that is that the Holy Spirit told her uh, right then and there when she when she arrived, as we're going to see here in a minute. Uh, but another interesting thing is that that term come to me, John the Baptist himself is going to use when he sees Jesus at the Jordan River during baptismal. We see that in Matthew 3.14. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee and, and, and comest thou to me. That's John the Baptist talking to Jesus. And then Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Uh, basically, uh, it, uh, it, was re it was a requirement uh, as a Jewish boy that, uh, uh, that he had to be baptized uh, when he became of age. <clears throat> we figured Jesus was about 30 years old right here because that, uh, based on Levitical law, you could not be a uh, teacher uh, or a rabbi, as he's uh, quite often called, uh, until you're 30 years old. So anyways, back to Luke 144. Jesus is not even born yet. So just wanted to kind of point that out that John the Baptist seemed to use that same term uh, 30 years later. Now, it's, now this is still Elizabeth talking. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the baby leaped in my room for joy. <clears throat> and blessed is she that believe, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. <clears throat> and Mary said, okay, and this starts another uh, song. Mary's going to, uh, basically it's a song that's sung back to Elizabeth of, uh, of what she now has been told by the messenger. And uh, so this is the point at which Elizabeth actually gets the the real word. So I, I still find it very fascinating that uh, Elizabeth knew this. And as far as we can tell, the, the angel never told her uh, because Zacharias was the one that was told about this. And so uh, it had to be the Holy Spirit that told Elizabeth uh, what was in Mary's womb at that point. <clears throat> and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Here Mary is actually recognizing the fact that what's in her womb is going to be uh, her savior also. And over in Habakkuk uh, 3.18 confer, uh, helps with this. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Okay, back to Luke 148. For he hath regarded this low estate of the handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And uh, uh, I might mention up to this point, too, that uh, uh, it was well known that during this period of time that most Jewish young ladies were uh, were very hopeful that uh, uh, or probably most mothers of daughters even were hopeful that their daughter would be the one that was chosen to be the uh, to carry the Messiah. Because they were all looking for him. Uh, and any good Jewish girl would have uh, thought uh, what, a, what a joy and blessing it would be to be the one honored uh, to do that. 
So I say that because remember we were talking about Elizabeth being barren. Uh, and for a woman to be barren in this time frame meant that she could not uh, bear or uh, be able to uh, have, be the uh, person who carried the Lord Jesus. And so that was a, a double whammy of a, a, of a uh, curse somewhat. Uh, is that, uh, and that's kind of the way Sarah maybe felt uh, way back when, uh, uh, when Abraham uh, was unable to, uh, she was unable to get uh, pregnant. And a few others, uh, particularly like uh, uh, Jacob, when he uh, finally uh, got uh, Rebecca uh, pregnant with uh, Joseph. Up to that point, she felt barren. And she did all kinds of strange things to try to uh, to try to get pregnant, even praying to other gods, which was a, a, a big no-no. <laughs> but that, uh, so for a woman in this time frame, that, that was like a, a really big deal. They wanted to keep themselves pure and to be ready uh, if they were chosen to be the one to carry the Messiah. So it, it's kind of what, uh, so we kind of got a double blessing here because Mary, uh, Elizabeth now is not only pregnant, but she is feeling really uh, honored that Mary, who's her cousin, uh, so within the family, has now got the Lord in her uh, womb. And uh, we know that, uh, that the girl had to be a, 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 a virgin. So it had to be. So I'm sure whenever a, a woman decided to get married, they realized that, uh, <clears throat> that they could no longer be the, uh, the one who carried the Messiah. Uh, but that uh, at least they would, uh, you know, they would be able to uh, help if they would have any children at all to carry on the name. That was a big deal, uh, anyways. So I thought I'd just point out. And First Samuel talks a little bit about uh, uh, what they're talking about here as being a handmaid. And she vowed a vow and said, "O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid." But will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. This is first Samuel one eleven. Uh, and this is when uh Hannah uh was trying was praying to get pregnant. Remember I just told you about a woman wanting to be pregnant because that was a uh, it was important to them. Uh, and so uh she was praying to the Lord and she and she promised that if the Lord would bless her with a man child that she would allow him, uh, would uh, give him to the service of the Lord. And that's ended up where Samuel can't end up coming from. Another nice verse about this subject over in Psalms 138. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. So uh, the one thing we can see already with Mary is that she's a, a very humble person. Uh, she's not uh, boasting or anything. Uh, she's happy about her situation, but she knows, too, that she needs a savior. So she's just as happy as everyone else that the Messiah is finally coming. <clears throat> so back to Luke 149. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And talking about great things, over in Psalm 71.19. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who has done great things, O God. Who is like unto thee? Also Psalms 126.2. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said them among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereby we are glad. And over in Psalms 111.9. He sent redemption unto the people. Uh, he hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. And that was uh, talking about being holy. Uh, there is Psalm 111. Also in Revelation 4, 8. And the four beasts has each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Okay, back to Luke 150. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. And some verses to help with this. Uh, this is all the things she's singing, actually. And I, and I truly believe that uh, 
Mary is actually being uh, given this information uh, from the Holy Spirit. Because uh, she, she seems to know a lot of these verses I'm pointing out all through the Bible. Uh, either she learned them herself or the Holy Spirit is helping her to uh, realize them. Because like I said, typically girls uh, did not go to uh, the same schools as the Jewish boys did to learn the Torah. And so a lot of these verses are interesting that they uh, point to certain verses in the Bible. And it's, and it's highly unlikely that she knew these verses. So I find it fascinating. She might have, and maybe she picked up things along the way, uh, or that uh, the Lord allowed her to uh, to learn. Uh, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children until the third and to the fourth generation. So you can see back in the, what we're looking at here in verse 50 is that uh, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. That's what I was pointing to. Also in Psalms 103, 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Okay, Luke 151. And Mary is still giving this speech that uh, they say is like a song. They call it Magnificent uh, as the name of the song. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And some verses on this subject over in Psalms 98.1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. And Peter also comments about it in 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself in, unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I think that's a good definition of uh, Mary. Is that she's not a, uh, I think that's probably why God chose her. Is that uh, there could be a lot of girls that this, this, this would give them a swell head and they would expect to be worshipped. And that's the one thing that uh, I think that uh, is apparent is that it'd be really easy to do. But it's an important thing that uh, we realize that even Mary needed a savior. Uh, so even though she was blessed and, and, and got the job of carrying Jesus, that he was coming to save her also. Because she was still a sinner. Uh, Jesus was the only one born without sin. Because his father was uh, was God. <clears throat> Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Okay, back to Luke one fifty two. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. So Mary here basically saying that she's just a, a simple, humble uh, uh, maid servant, uh, willing to serve her Lord. She's of low degree, meaning she's nothing, nobody special. And some great verses on this over in 1 Samuel 2, 7 and 8. This is uh, the same, uh, they call this the Song of Hannah. Uh, and it's a, uh, if you get a chance, you might re read through uh, 1 Samuel 1 through 10. Because it basically mirrors what Mary is saying here. Uh, that Hannah was saying about uh, her miraculous uh Looking forward, you know, looking forward to having a son and allowing him to be, uh, to uh, be in the Lord's service. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lineth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them according to princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth and the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. That's just part of it, but the whole thing is a is a uh, song that uh, Hannah sang in First Samuel. Okay, back to Luke one fifty three. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away uh, empty away. And we see over in Matthew five six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So they shall be filled. So that's the answer to that. Luke one fifty four. He hath opened the, ser uh, the servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. 
back in uh, Isaiah 41.8, talks about this. But thou Israel art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Okay, back to Luke 155. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And speaking of the seed, that goes all the way back to, uh, well, here in Galatians 3.16, Paul mentions this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds is of many, but of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Uh, so this is pointing to the seeds mentioned all the way back uh, in Genesis to Abraham by God. I remember the seed, uh, his, his seed will be like the, uh, the stars of heaven. Well, one of those seeds was going to be the Savior. And that was Jesus Christ. That's what it's basically saying there. And over in uh, Hebrews 8.8, 8, got a parallel verse. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come with the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judea. So we're entering into a phase here too that uh, that verse kind of pops that into us, our memory that Jesus is the beginning of a new covenant. Uh, and that uh, we know that uh, as we move forward that Jesus has come not only to save, our, save, our, save us from our sins, but also to start a new covenant uh, of, uh, of the church and a new covenant of uh, salvation by grace. Well, actually, there's always been salvation by grace. So I take that back. But that uh, it's going to start a new covenant between both the Jewish nation and he's also going to start the church. Uh, but as Jesus goes through his ministry, he realized that, uh, uh, remember that uh, the Jewish people didn't accept him. Uh, so that they uh, they were putting kind of on the back burner for a while. But this starts the new covenant. Uh, this this with the birth of Jesus Christ. And Paul in Romans also mentions in uh, 11.28. 11.28, yeah. As concerning the gospel... They are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sakes. So here that uh, Paul is kind of, I think at this point, he's talking to some Jewish people who aren't accepting the word uh, that Jesus Christ was the, was the Messiah. And he was commenting about that, that uh, uh, they're not accepting this new covenant. Okay, last but not least for this chat, for this portion. Luke 156, and Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, I just thought I would uh, uh, find it interesting that the timing, uh, Mary have, may have uh, probably stayed there till the birth of John. Remember that uh, Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary went there. Another three months is nine months. We got uh, nine months pregnancy. Uh, that hasn't changed much over the uh, generations and uh, give or take a week or two but that uh uh so mary looks like she stayed there uh for three months to wait for elizabeth to have her to help her uh prior to you know being at this point elizabeth's in her last tri trimester and so mary probably helped her out and elizabeth was a lot older and so she uh probably had uh a little bit more challenging for her uh, and so mary probably felt a little like she wanted to help out as much as she could. But she had her own pregnancy to deal with. And so she would be about three months pregnant. And now she's heading back to Nazareth. <laughs> I find this fascinating that uh, uh, after uh, six more months or five more months in Nazareth, she's going to end up coming back down here uh, to uh, actually to Bethlehem. Well, I just move this out of the way. Bethlehem, which is right in the same area. It's just it's barely right below Jerusalem. Uh, and so uh, Mary's going to do a little yo-yo wax, and she's going to leave here and go back up to Nazareth for six months, uh, or actually about uh, you know nine months. Well, she's already three months pregnant now. Travels back. And I'm sure at this point Joseph or um, or Elizabeth maybe made arrangements to have somebody help her get back to Nazareth, and then she waited up there for the next six months, uh, and to wait for Jesus to be born, and then. Uh, there's Joseph uh, coming on back down to uh, uh, Bethlehem, which is just below Jerusalem. So that's the lesson for today. And uh, I guess it didn't take too long. But I just uh, point out too that I find it fascinating how well versed in the scriptures uh, that uh, Mary was. And like I mentioned, 
uh, which was very untypical of women in that period of time. Uh, so I can see that the Holy Spirit was definitely showing, uh, he was get, probably feeding her the information she needed to uh, to really show, show uh, to uh, Elizabeth and uh, and that uh, and that's what uh, that whole conversation was about really was that uh, the Holy Spirit explaining to both of them what was going on and that uh, who for real was actually in her womb both of them as we'll see going forward in Luke we're going to see the uh, you know the, the life of John the Baptist and of course the life of Jesus and so we'll study that and uh, it will be interesting journey I'm looking forward to it so let me pray Thank you, Father, so much for this time to look at your word and to uh, get a little bit better understanding of, the, of some of the things that you planned, uh, planned ahead of time. And that uh, you're always looking out for us and helping us, uh, providing the pathway to uh, righteousness. And we praise you and we thank you so much for what you've done for us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. So you guys all have a great day and I will talk to you again tomorrow.